Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Julie Mulvihill. I'm the Executive Director for Humanities Kansas, and we're just absolutely delighted to have you with us today for this month's installment of The Big Idea. Uh, the Big Idea, as some of you know, is an online program that's intended to promote and spark fresh thinking in the humanities, and um, you're really in for a treat today. So just one housekeeping task for you to keep in mind with. We're all so used to Zoom now, I hardly need to even say it. But if you do have a question that you want to ask our guests, please put it, you can either put it in the chat box or the Q&A, that's completely up to you. We'll be checking both of those throughout today's session. Now, some of you know that each big idea begins with a short essay by our featured speaker that includes additional resources for you to utilize. Maybe it's more poetry, maybe it's a video, maybe it's a book, who knows. And all of these things are really intended um, to give you the motivation and the opportunity to think more about this particular topic, to do, as we like to say, spark a conversation around your dinner table with your friends and your family, and really take this conversation out, right? Become part of that movement of ideas that we talk about a lot here at Humanities Kansas. So the big idea presentations build from this essay. So Valerie will probably reference that in her conversation today with Gary Jackson. So I want to get to the heart of this and let me introduce you to our host for today, Dr. Valerie Mendoza. She's going to interview and talk about uh, talk with our guest. Dr. Mendoza is a Topeka native. She received her PhD in history from the University of California, Berkeley. Valerie works in the public humanities where her research focuses on the history of the Latinx community in Kansas and the Midwest. And Valerie has served as a consultant um, to the Kansas State Historical Society, the Kansas Creative Arts Industries Commission and the National Folklife Network. So Valerie, take it away. Thank you, Julie. And welcome, Gary. It is um, a pleasure to have you with us. Yes, so, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so Gary Jackson, our guest today, was born and raised in Topeka, Kansas. He is the author of Origin Story, published by the University of New Mexico Press in 2021, and Missing You, Metropolis, um, which received the 2009 Cave Canem Poetry Prize. He is also the co-editor of The Future of Black, Afrofuturism, Black Comics, and Superhero Poetry, which I definitely want to hear more about. He's an associate professor of creative writing at the College of Charleston in South Carolina. So... Let's get started because um, your essay on Kansas sentiment, memory, and obsession, which are all really variants of the same thing, um, just is such an evocative title that draws readers um, in. And you write about how you use poetry to, quote, write your own existence into being. So can you talk a little bit about that for us? Sure. Um... And thank you again, like Valerie um, and Leslie and Julie for, for putting all this together. Um, I was so happy to get a, an excuse to write a little bit of uh, nonfiction for a change, right? So it was a pleasure to write that, that um, I guess I shouldn't call it a craft essay, but, but the essay for the, for the big read. And yeah, and, and a lot of what prompted me to initially choose poetry as kind of the genre I wanted to to write in because I I actually originally started as a fiction writer. I thought that's what I was going to do. I was going to write like the next great American novel, um, which never happened. But but one of the uh, one of the things I find the most alluring about poetry is that I can write about myself and my own experiences, and I can kind of write them into being. And maybe another way to say that is. Um, you know, in, in both of my books, really, I write a lot about loss. Um, I write a lot about people who have passed away that I knew or was very close with. And, and, I, and because of that, I really am a, have grown attached to the idea of a poem as kind of a site of um, happening or a site of, of um, where something can come, something comes back to life when it's in the poem. Like when I read a poem out loud, um, when a reader reads the poem out loud, that experience becomes alive again. 
Um, and so to me, that's what I think of when I talk about writing myself into existence, you know, like, like I can kind of capture these stories and these moments of my life that traditionally are stories that I don't, I didn't typically see at the time when I was first writing poetry. And so, you know, I, I know there are more authors out there now because I'm more well read than I was when I first started, but when I was coming up, I didn't read or I had never really read like about anyone's experience growing up as a young black man in Topeka, Kansas, for example, right? Um, and you could even take that type of identity further, right? Like a young black man who's liberal growing up in a fairly conservative landscape who also likes comic books and, and is a big nerd and, and an outcast and so all of these things. And so um, when I would write these poems that was kind of about that existence or that experience, it, it helped validate my own life in ways that I wasn't entirely expecting or entirely aware that that's what I was doing until after the fact. Yeah, um, I really like that. How you talk about, you know, reading it out loud brings it to life um, again, right? Yeah. And it brings it to life in you know different ways depending on the reader as well or the yeah. audience yeah that's... yeah yeah <laughs> and and yeah and, and I don't have any that, and maybe that's one of the reasons I like poetry so much is because it's such an interpretive genre right like like there are certainly probably wrong ways to read a poem I'm sure right like if somebody reads reads a poem about x and they take away from it you know oh this is a poem about Mickey Mouse or something right but 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 really, like the beauty of poetry is that depending on this, the reader's experience that they're filtering their reading through, um, it changes kind of how that poem impacts them. And so I'm all for that, right? I mean, part of that is 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 about the the malleability of language, right? Or or maybe even the failure of language, right? Like I'm trying to use words to capture something that that words can never adequately capture. But because yeah. yeah. So yeah. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I love I love thinking about it that way. So tell me, how long have you been writing poetry? Because you said, you know, that you would wanted to be fiction writer first. So when and how did the poetry piece come about? <laughs> yeah, like um, you know, I'll I'll make this as short of an anecdote as possible. But when I first went to Washburn, since I was born and raised in Topeka, Kansas. I took a class with with Tom Averill and Amy Fleury was the poetry professor at the time. And, and Tom and Amy both co-taught a creative writing class. And I really fell in love with fiction. And that's mainly because I was I'm used to stories at that age. I, I just read more stories in poetry, um, despite writing some poetry in high school. Um, but because of the job I had, I worked third shift at Jostens, which I know is no longer there, but I, I think it's something else now. I'm not sure what that plant is now, but um, because I was working third shift there, I would write my short stories during my lunch breaks at like two in the morning, and those stories became shorter and shorter and shorter, and I realized I was kind of writing poems, and, and then when I took the Amy Fleury side of that intro class and started learning more about poetry, I realized that's kind of what I was writing without realizing it. And that kind of became, or was the beginning of that love affair that I developed with poetry. Oh, that's so cool. I love that story. <laughs> um, so you were mentioning about how, you know, poetry is a way to write about yourself and loss. And, and you talk a lot about, you know, in your essay, letting your garden uh, down, right? To write really deeply personal um poems and 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 tell hard stories how do you do that because i i really struggle with vulnerability yeah um it's a great question and and i i look at poetry as like a great let me think of how i want to say it like for me it's it's been such a great genre because I myself have such a terrible memory. Like I really do. Like I, I forget books, like a month after I read them, I forget the names of people all the time. I forget, you know, all kinds of things. There's total slices of my own life that I have no recollection of, you know. Um, but I like the idea that as a genre, poetry is about kind of maybe equal parts truth and lie, or 
you know, other writers talk about how a poem is about capturing an emotional truth, but it's not as concerned with like factual truth. So it becomes kind of this middle ground between like pure fiction, which can be entirely made up and, and creative nonfiction. Um, so there are elements of the author maybe in a poem and there are elements that are entirely speculative. And, and depending on the poem and depending on the poet, that ratio can become very, um, you know, amorphous, right, or nebulous. So, so for me, I really like the idea that, uh, that when I'm writing a poem, it's an exercise in like, how much of myself am I putting on the paper? And sometimes it's all of it, you know, in terms of being vulnerable. But, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> but I'm also um, aware that there always has to be a layer of intimacy in a poem because I want a reader to experience my sense of loss to maybe communicate on this broader topic of loss because that's really what it comes down to right like we're all just trying to figure out how to exist in the world <laughs> and yeah. so yeah and so instead of writing about these these big ideas with like a capital you know L like loss or death or living or how you enter the world you know it's like I want to capture my version of that and if I can do that well enough it'll cause a reader to reflect on their version of that same you mm -hmm. know navigation so right yeah going back to that you know depends on who's reading it and and their interpretation yeah, yeah. awesome well um can you read us um, one of your poems? Um, you talk about, um, you know, poetry is an act of reclamation and a, a reckoning against um, forgetting. And so I just, I'd love to hear. Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to. Um, I'll read a poem. Um, I was just in um, Salina, Kansas, as part of the Humanities Council there. They, they have like a Salina Poetry Festival um in April so like every week they brought out like a different like Kansas poet or a poet with ties to Kansas and so it was a great reading and if anybody out there was also at that reading I'm gonna read a poem that I should have read at at, at that reading but I didn't because it's called Kansas <laughs> and and um and this poem is kind of an answer to why my mother ultimately left Kansas so this is a question that my mother and myself, we, we used to get a lot about like, don't you miss home? Don't you hate home um, sometimes? And so, yeah, I think this is a good poem that kind of captures that idea of, of trying to reclaim a voice that that um, you feel like you lost at some point. And in this case, it's kind of my mother's voice. Kansas. It's love you left, we'll say when you never come back for bells for the dead, for the gravestone heads, the only ones that don't keep count. Don't we know it's love that keeps you away, that marks every mile devotion? You would have went to the end with each one, made Orpheus turn back, would have fell, would have leapt, would have left. The leaving is easy. The living is easy. Living with ghosts, it was easy to give up your home to your father, struck with the same grief of living, demanding, what are you gonna do with my mama's house? Shorn grass and damp dirt, they'll put me in the middle. I kick the ground like tires, feeling dumb without flowers, tokens, grief, anything in my hands. You'll bring me back home, won't you? Stamp it down as if the flat earth could answer. Sometimes this too is love. You left. That's it. Thanks. That's awesome. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, as you're reading that, I'm thinking about, you know, wow, yeah, I, I relate to that because I can think of, a, you know, a, a, a point in my life, you know, and a place in my life, you know, that, um, so yeah, oh, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, oh, thanks, Father, for, for having me read it. <laughs> um, um, 
So one of the things that really struck me in your essay, um, I'm a historian, right? And so, you know, one of my focuses is on revealing those stories that um, haven't been told or have been lost, right? Not told yet, and especially about people of color, right? And so when I think of poetry, before I read your essay, I always thought of it, you know, in terms of language and the beauty of the words and maybe the of the rhythms, right? Or, or in some cases, the rhymes. Um, but um, you really, um, started to make me think when you um, talked about, you know, um, st whose story is being told through the poetry. And, you know, that example that you, the poem you just read is, is, is something like, you know, speaks to that. So can you talk more about how poetry um, has been and, and can be used this way as a way of telling stories? <laughs> Yeah, no, and, and sorry about that. I'm so glad you brought that up, Valerie. Um, because um, yeah, part of part of the introduction I know Julie gave you is that you write about kind of the history of like Latinx people in, mm -hmm. in the Midwest, yeah. right in Kansas. And yeah. So um yeah, like like I have a really good friend here at, at the College of Charleston in African American Studies, and she's a historian and, and a scholar and an African American uh lit scholar. And so so we did a joint reading because she has a book that's kind of about the history of um, lynching in the South and kind of the Jim Crow South. And, and, and we did this reading together where I would read my poems and she would read excerpts from her, from her book and, and they tied so nicely together. And one of the things she told me, because she's also a Baldwin scholar too, um, she said, um, you know, she's like, you know, James Baldwin famously said, you know, poets are one of the few people who, who know history. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, I don't know the direct quote, so I won't even try to, to, to cite it verbatim. Um, but she was just like, yeah, he, he said that like, you know, poets have a, have a tendency to not forget, which, which is ironic, because I just said that my memory is terrible. And, mm -hmm. and, and, but part of the reason I approach poetry is because it kind of forces me to write down these histories and and the histories of other people um and then if i can get it on paper i can preserve it not maybe just for myself but you know for other readers to read um so these stories the people in my family or in my life aren't kind of lost when when they pass away and 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 i feel like so often especially people of color don't get to be heard in in a lot of spaces but certainly like, you know, my mother would be someone who, whose story would never be shared or heard in like the, in like the space of what we consider like high art poetry, right? And so it's very intentional on my part in the second book, especially where I have these poems that not only are about my mother and in her voice, but I take old interviews I did with her and I preserve the way she speaks and her syntax and her grammar because I, I want to kind of show the musicality of her voice, um, even if other people might say, you know, like, well, she doesn't speak like proper English, you know? So, so a lot of what I do is kind of about reclaiming a lot of those ideas of, of who can speak and who can tell their stories and, and why they can or can't. You know, uh, I don't know if I answered that question, but yeah, no, absolutely. But you also made me want to hear another poem. <laughs> so, <laughs> do you mind? I can. I can. I don't know if we have time, but it's up to you, Valerie. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, let me see. We'll see. Since I just talked about those 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 particular poems, I'll I'll read one from there. Um, so let's do. I'll do one I don't read very often, actually. Um, and so each of these poems, there's about 12 of them in the book, and they all are titled Interview Featuring. And so they're, they're these erasure poems. So they have like kind of snippets of like language, but there's a lot of white space um, mm -hmm. because I've removed a lot of kind of the core interview that these poems are kind of based off of. Um, 
so I'll just read it. And and they are entirely in my mother's like voice, like actual things she said. And so I enter the poem as kind of the interviewer. And so I'll try to like put quotes or something to signify the very few times I like entered the poem, which is not very often. This poem is called Interview Featuring Gun and Three Daddies. You're not supposed to give babies honey. We stayed down there a good while, but after they tried to kill, I said, I ain't gonna be able to do it. Wait, but I was born in Kansas, right? Yep, I got pregnant on my birthday. You was nine months later. Always said, mama's baby, daddy's maybe. That was the last time I saw him? No. Oh yeah, LA. That's when he said, get in the car, he said, get in the car. I didn't know what the hell was going on. I didn't see the gun. Your grandma Beverly had a hard life. She seen her mother get killed. Her daddy was real light. Carl's daddy was a Jackson. He was a, what you call him, a bigamy, bigamy, polygamist? Polygamy, whatever. So Beverly gave Carl that name too, see? That's just like us. We all like that. Separated, divorced, married, pregnant, adopted. You know, I just laugh. Laughter. That's how we came up. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. We actually have a question from the audience about um, these erasure poems. Sure. Um, so um, can you explain erasure poetry as a practice? And how did you come to telling your mother's story this way? Sure. Um, and uh, it's it's um it's such a perfect question, too, because I actually in in the book, so those poems show up in is called Origin Story. So in the book, I even have a note section that kind of explains it in more detail, kind of kind of how that works. Um, but here, it's um, like ten years ago after I wrote the first book, Missing in Metropolis. My family, in general, was like, "You should write about us," and that is, in and of itself was kind of odd because most because <laughs> most of the time, you know, your if your family finds out you write stories that are kind of part autobiograph part autobiographical for the most part they're like don't write about us but but my family was the opposite and my mother especially um was really keen on this idea and so she invited me to come do these interviews with her not too long after the first book came out and so this was over 10 years ago now and and at the time she just thought like you can interview me you can record it and we'll look over old photo albums and my mother has such a wonderful memory that she was telling me like all these stories about people in my family. And the idea was that I would use this as kind of soil to grow these, these new poems out of for an eventual second book. And that kind of worked, but it, it didn't really click like I thought it would. And so I kind of shelved those interviews. And it wasn't until years later that another friend of mine, another poet reminded me about that project. And, and she said like, you should, you should take those interviews and turn them into poems themselves is kind of all she said. And, and it was such a great idea that I went back and I transcribed them. And so I had like a 60 page document total of like all 15 interviews. And then erasure is simply the process of me slowly kind of peeling back as much of the language as possible and kind of leaving whatever is left on the page to kind of become the poem. And, and I had all these rules I put on myself, which I, I won't get into because of time, but but a lot of that's in the book explanation. And, and what resulted was kind of about 12 or 13 of these poems. And originally, the erasure interviews were as long as the original interviews themselves. So that means like maybe on the span of 10 pages, there would be only 20 words, which I loved, but editors, not so much. So, so, so I had to kind of compress them and that became like its own process. And, and then the result of all of that is, are the interview poems in, in the book. And, and they were honestly the last poems that I wrote 
that kind of brought that book together. So, so it was kind of a nice, um, a wonderful uh, serendipity that that friend of mine suggested that because I don't know what would have happened otherwise. Oh, I love that. Um, Cause I'm a person who does oral histories as well. So you've just given me another, um, <laughs> another way to, to use them and, 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 yeah make something else that's I love I love that idea and so what did your family think of these poems so they they really liked them um and and I could I could speak mainly for my mother um she she loves it even though she does tell me sometimes she doesn't understand them but she understands them more than that she gives herself credit for and um and on the cover of the book so my mother is biracial she her mother is Korean and her father is black and so they're the two on the on the cover. Um, my grandmother has since passed away, but my grandfather, who's who's on the cover, he's still alive. And, and I did a reading back in Topeka a, a few years ago, and he showed up to it uh, with some of my uncles and cousins, and and they liked it. Um, there was a moment where he was shaking his head, and it worried me. <laughs> I was like, "What did I say?" But I, I, I asked him later what he thought and, and he said he really liked it. So I don't, you know, I don't know if he was, you know, that was just a gesture about something else. But, but, um, and then he asked when he, when I was going to give him a copy of it. So, which I have since given him. So, so I think they, they like it. At least that's what they tell me. Cool. Cool. So can you talk to us a little bit about some of your, um, influences? Sure. Um, I know like in the in the essay, right, that I wrote, I, I reference um, two writers primarily, like Mary Rufel, um, a poet and kind of just brilliant essayist, and uh, Carl Phillips, another poet and brilliant essayist. Um, Carl Phillips is just a wonderful poet. Um, the poem I reference is from is is from a book from the devotions. And and the poem itself is called As from a Quiver of Arrows. And it's probably one of my like favorite poems just ever um and he's such a beautiful like kind of lyrically intense poet um who writes about identity but also just writes about being just a human being right being being a queer black man being a person who has suffered losses you know as well um and that poem in particular is about that aspect of um what do you do when a when someone dies um, and Mary Rufel has, she's a great poet too, but she has a book called Madness, Rack, and Honey. And that is, in my opinion, one of the best books about poetry I've ever read. And so if anybody out there wants to read a book about poetry, um, you should read it. She she writes about everything from like Emily Dickinson to how poets tackle sentimentality to how to end a poem, how to begin a poem. But it's not a book that you would read for like kind of mechanical kind of craft or instructions right it's not very prescriptive in that way um but like one of my favorite examples is she says one way to address sentimentality is not to be less of a flower but to also be a flower and a stone <laughs> so, so she says things like that and like if you get it you get it um but yeah she's she's great and so those are two. And then, of course, a lot of my influences come from like comic books. I grew up reading, you know, comic books from an early age. And so um, if anybody out there is like a big superhero nerd, um, Chris Claremont is a famous comic book writer who wrote the Uncanny X-Men in the 80s and 90s. And when he wrote that comic, mutants were very much an allegory for people of color and for kind of civil rights um activism and and those that period of the x-men world really kind of informed my understanding of all of those concepts oh cool that's a perfect segue because i want to talk about that next but i want to bring up um if we can one of your motion poems from your website for us to look at because i think it, it kind of um brings in all these all these next topics, the superhero, the Afrofuturism and everything. 
there's one boy on fire and another drowning. You only get to save one for your final exam. So you lift the wet boy from the lake and don't realize your mistake until Superman touches down. Sorry, son. We can't have someone who chooses their own over everyone else. The boy's brown fingers hold tight to your emblem. Leave wet impressions on your chest. Next year, the same. And the same after that. Every time you choose wrong, blame it on Empire. Superman, his arm rung around your neck. We're trying to save the world here. His eyes, pure blue, confirming what you already knew. You always save the ones never meant to survive. That's just so awesome. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about it, how that came to being and everything. Yeah, no, sure. And I'm, and I'm so glad you, you, um, saw that and, and wanted to to play it because it's such a fun thing I did once that um that I haven't done since and and I uh and I have to say I can't really take that much credit for it because what it was was motion poems I, I think it's since lost a lot of its funding so I, unfortunately I don't think it's doing this anymore but it was this organization where um kind of a nonprofit you would send poems to them and they would select different poems every year to kind of curate a um, like a a short film, and so so they each year they would release like fifteen poems, and they each were short films that would total for like two hours, and so that's all I did. Like that poem was originally published, you know, in a in a journal, and I sent it to them kind of on a whim, and they selected it, and unlike most of the other poems they selected, that one they decided to animate instead of do like a short film and and um I was just so thrilled and and beyond grateful that they chose it and and had such a vision for how to translate it into you know that short animated film so I had no um like influence on what they did like they didn't ask me or anything you know what to do so, all, you know, the the images, you know, the fact that they directly tied that poem into the civil rights, you know, into the 60s, that was all them, you know, that was just that their interpretation of it. And it aligned so well with, you know, I think, you know, for, for my, uh, from my perspective, it aligned so well with what I was trying to do with that poem. So, I, yeah, I think it, I just think it was awesome that they did that, so. So I should only take like 20% of the credit, like <laughs> for how that turned out, but yeah. Well, talk to us a little bit about like this, this interconnection between, you know, Afrofuturism, comics, you know, and everything you're doing now, basically. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a few um, lines, right. That kind of connect those worlds for me. Um, some are much more um, intimate than others, and so I can start with the more intimate lines that I that that kind of set me on that path. But you know, one of them is in, in my first book, Missing Metropolis. I write a lot about superheroes and comics. It's 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 mainly because I grew up reading them, and going back to something I had said earlier about the idea of kind of reclamation and the idea of kind of putting kind of showing that that these stories matter, right? Stories from people of color or people from marginalized communities. In a similar way, I felt that with comics as well, where where when I was reading them even as a kid, I was like, these are doing kind of important work. Um, and they're talking about subject matter that really resonates with what's going on in the world, but we tend to look at them as kind of juvenile, right? Um, and so comic books are kind of seen as this lowbrow art. And in my mind, I thought like, what better way to kind of 
kind of feature them than, than to kind of explore what they mean in like a highbrow art, like poetry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and also, you know, I, I was writing the poems about comics about a period in my life where I had a very good friend who passed away and, and he committed suicide. And so, and we grew up together and we were like brothers. Um, and so also in a way, I was kind of writing about these different modes of escape. And, and that's kind of what the first book is about, Missing You Metropolis, um, which Leslie so nicely put in the um, chat. She's like a, she's like a pre-talk. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, so, so um, that first book is very much about escapism and kind of the diff all the different ways we escape through fantasy or, you know, or, or drugs or alcohol or sex um, or more permanent ways, you know, like suicide, for example. And so that's another way I kind of see those those worlds connecting. And then in terms of just kind of Afrofuturism in general and speculative poetry, that goes back kind of to my idea about how kind of we write ourselves into existence. And one of the things I, I'm so um, taken with with Afrofuturism and, and sci-fi in general is that it's a way to kind of write yourself into being. And as, and as Black people, it's not enough to imagine a future where we exist, but to do that, you also have to right, imagine a present where we exist to get to that future. And also um, like we can kind of revise or reclaim a past history as well that kind of connects us to the, to the present and to the future. So for me, Afrofuturism is not just about like black science fiction, it's about like, in order to get there, you also have to imagine yourselves living in this moment and in the moments that led up to this moment. And so it's a way also to kind of write yourselves into existence, mm -hmm. the fact that we are here, right? Um, and, and, you know, and all the things about utopias and dystopias are byproducts of that, that you can write as you want. But at its core, I feel like it's about seeing yourself in this world, in the, in the past and the present and in the, in the future. Um, and so that's the allure there too. Oh, I love that. The historian in me loves that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, as as uh, we near the end of our time, could you read us one more? Since we're right. sure, sure. Um, I'm trying to think. I'll I'll read like a. I'll read like a superhero poem. I guess mm -hmm. um, that'd be awesome. Yeah. You know, I am not the biggest Superman fan, despite the title of my book about Metropolis, but I'll I'll read a poem that's that's in the voice of Lois Lane that I don't read very often. So um, this poem's called The Dilemma of Lois Lane. When you first showed me your secret, the red S hidden beneath your shirt all these years, I lost my mind. God just looking at you, thinking how those eyes will never fade or dull, how your hair will never uncurl and fall away, and how even though you haven't worked out since living on the farm, your body will always be as solid as diamonds. And yet, I have to pretend those things don't exist, that you'll always be the Clark that steps on people's shoes in elevators, the Clark that spills coffee on the break room floor. But you blow forest fires out with those same breaths I take into me when we kiss and when you're tired, you dip into stars for afternoon naps. And I don't know which man is real. Sometimes when we're alone at home fixing dinner, you'll pretend to wince when you cut yourself. And I find myself hoping that the tiniest drop of blood will bloom on your finger. Thank you so much. That was thank awesome. You. Yeah, thank you, Leslie. <laughs> All right. Or Leslie, I'm sorry, Valerie. I don't know why I said <laughs> Leslie. Thank you, Valerie. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Well, it's been a really nice chatting with you and that poem brought up even more questions than I had, but we're out of time. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Julie. <laughs> What a way to close out National Poetry Month, right? I mean, Gary, that was just 
remarkable. And you gave us so much good food for thought. And, and I've been thinking about, you know, poems are so interesting because you hear them some way when you read them silently, you hear them differently when someone reads them to you, and then you hear them differently when you're the one reading it to someone else. And so I've been sort of thinking about kind of that sort of shape-shifting that poems have that I think is really a unique um, I mean, a, a unique thing about poems. So I'm, I'm out of my depth, so I'm going to just be quiet, but I've been thinking about um, kind of how that all works together. But anyway, thank you so much, Valerie and Gary. And, you know, if you can't get enough of Gary Jackson, I'm happy to say that Humanities Kansas is about ready to launch later this spring, Wild Words, which is a poetry chapbook featuring native wildflowers, and we're pairing those two together. And Gary was kind enough to provide a poem for that book. And so you can find out more about that on our website. And I think Leslie has put that in the chat box for you to see our placeholding link there. So we really encourage you to follow along on our social media or sign up for our e-news so you get more information about that. Because I know you'll want to read for the Prairie Violet, which was made for this particular book. And before we adjourn, I also want to say that mark your calendar for May 25th. That will be our last big idea for the season. And then we'll take a summer break and rejoin in either September or October. Um, and our topic will be Pancho Villa's Kansas Connection with Professor um, Marcus Macias. So I believe he's from Fort Hayes State University. And we're really looking forward to that as well. And with that, I'll say goodbye. And thank you once again, Gary. And thank you to you, Valerie, as well. And thanks to Leslie for coordinating it. So until then, bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>